good morning in Washington. And I also know that we have uh, those that are joining on both sides of the Atlantic. So good afternoon and, and hopefully everybody's ready for the weekend uh, for those who are joining and are a few, head, few hours ahead of us. Um, on behalf of the German Marshall Fund in the United States, we wanna welcome you uh, to, today, to today's conversation. Uh, we are really pleased to have the foreign minister um, of Lithuania joining us today, uh, Landsbergis, uh, who has had a really incredibly busy week here in Washington, D.C. Uh, so we're pleased that you could you know, join us for just a short period of time. Um, and, and of course, uh, not only was it a busy week meeting with U.S. administration officials, it was also members of Congress. Um, and those in, in the think tank and NGO community that are uh, following closely the work of your government uh, in Lithuania, uh, but also the challenges uh, regionally and globally, uh, where Lithuania seems to be smack in the middle of some of the most challenging issues. Uh, my name is Jonathan Katz. I'm a, I'm a senior fellow, but also director of democracy initiatives at the German Marshall Fund in Washington. I'm also director of the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group. Uh, Christine Berzina, my colleague, who's in Washington, D.C., um, who just uh, has traveled and has joined us in D.C., but has long been part of GMF's uh, leadership, uh, both in terms of security, defense, uh, energy, you name it, um, a real leader, a foreign policy uh, leader. Just thank you so much for joining us and being my co-host today and moderating this discussion. Uh, as I mentioned, the foreign minister is in Washington this week, um, and uh, we were uh, good enough to see the statement put out by Secretary of State Blinken, really speaking to uh, the value and the importance of U.S. bilateral relationship with Lithuania, uh, but touched on a number of key issues, which we'll, we'll focus on uh, over, the coming, uh, over the coming hour. Uh, but again, Foreign Minister, thank you so much. Um, you know, when, uh, when uh, your embassy, which we've worked with closely here, reached out to host this meeting, we were really pleased that we could do it uh, because um, the region is facing, and Lithuania, deep challenges. And I want to just say that, you know, having sort of watched you as you took over just uh, a short while ago in this position, it's more than just a short while ago, but in the midst of both the pandemic, uh, but other challenges, um, I really view your work and that of your foreign ministry, both, you know, sort of rising stars in, in national security, both in Europe and the transatlantic space. Um, but we're really pleased that you could be here. Um, I did want to do one thing um, is just I, I want to do a little bit of your bio just as part of the uh, and that'll do a little bit of housekeeping, too, and then turn to you for for an opening uh, for an opening statement. Um, but I wanted to just highlight that you've long been uh, in the political scene. Uh, in Lithuania, both as chairman of the Homeland Union, uh, uh, Lithuanian Christian Democrats since 2015, uh, a member of the European Parliament, a member of the Lithuanian Parliament, an active member of the group of the European People's Party. Um, and you've served in, in many different positions, national security, political, you have sort of the blessing of, of both dealing with domestic issues, but also international issues. And I think in Lithuania, it seems to me, uh, even domestic issues are really internationally focused, they're intertwined. And of course, you know, when we think about uh, what's taking place, the Zapad exercise um, across the border in Belarus, all the challenges over the past year, um, Lithuania stands out as a country, both on the front lines of, of democracy, but also a country that punches way above its weight in many ways. Um, and I know we'll talk both about the challenges of China, uh, but also of uh, both Russia, Belarus, uh, transition in the region, economic challenges. Um, and most of those issues really were, were in focus when I saw the Secretary of State's uh, statement. Uh, Part of this will be picking up and supporting and strengthening its partnership, but we really want to hear from you, and I'll turn it over to you shortly to to really maybe talk a little bit about what these foreign policy priorities and challenges are that you see from Vilnius. Uh, but also, um, one thing that I wanted to ask you too was about about um, you have come here and you're obviously looking to strengthen the relationship. One thing that I have heard 
in conversations um, is that I think everybody is appreciative that the Biden administration is seeking to strengthen its partnership uh, with countries in Europe and that the transatlantic relationship is a cornerstone of foreign policy between the United States security, transatlantic security. Uh, but I've also heard on the European side, um, some saying, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, that the United States is not doing enough or could do more to strengthen that relationship. So what I wanted to do first is to, if I could, just, just kick it over to you um, to, to have this conversation and feel free to have some coffee as you're doing it, because I know it's early morning. Um, and, and ask you about, you know, really, you know, as I mentioned, Vilnius is in, and your government has taken on some very challenging issues. We didn't even discuss the migration challenge too, um, and, um, and faces real, real challenges and, and is looking for additional support um, as you take on some of the larger foreign policy challenges of Russia, China, Belarus, regional challenges. Uh, what do those foreign policy priorities look like for you? And then also, maybe you can answer the question. Uh, and I'm curious to hear about how your meetings went this week, and and if you're if you're seeking some type of of you know of 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 real um, you know things that you take away from this week, and what the United States can do. What does it look like going forward? What can the United States do to strengthen the relationship? So, Mr. Foreign Minister, if I can send it over to you, and then on behalf of GMF, thank you so much again for joining us. Well, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for uh, this <laughs> very nice presentation and uh, nice introduction. I'm honored to be here with you and uh, have this opportunity to uh, to talk. Um, uh, I think that you raised some very very important questions. So, I will start with the situation uh, in uh, in Lithuania. Uh, we're you rightfully mentioned that you know even um, even though we still feel as a, as a new government, we started working last December, uh, but uh, you know we're reminded that time is uh, flies very quickly, and uh, so it's uh, it soon be be a year when we when we started uh, our our work <clears throat> in the new government. One of the priorities that we set out in, in the government program, not only in my ministry but across across the whole across the whole uh, government is the support for democratic forces and democratic movements uh, across the, the globe. That was a new thing to uh, Lithuanian government because we usually would have um, uh, support lines in, in, our, in, in any government program for, for uh, countries that are close to us. Uh, we've been very active in Eastern Partnership countries in Ukraine, in Georgia and Moldova. Uh, we, you know, we have good contacts with Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, we have a lot of friends there. We're uh, strong embassies, and you know, we're pretty much involved there. Same goes for Belarus. Uh, being uh, one of the closest neighbors, we have extensive uh, political and economical economic ties with with the country. So it was obvious um, that uh, that we will be uh, the ones or one of the first ones to to react after last year's stolen election in 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 belarus and to invite uh, the belarusian opposition uh, over to to vilnius to have a shelter and refuge um, uh, so close to their home and with the possibility to have a, a safe space to uh, to pursue their political ideas and have a con have a conversation an open conversation with the rest of the world uh, but this government um, felt strongly about the whole principle that it should not be geographical if you're supporting democracy and so basically you have to do it uh, you have to reach out and others have could should have a possibility to reach out to you and i like this uh, i like this phrase uh, it's not that often actually used it's uh, the canary in the mine uh, and i think that lithuania is currently in in this sort of position how uh, is there a possibility for a government, a uh, democratic Western government, to show meaningful support to democracies across the globe and withstand the coercion? So when the um, migration crisis started in the beginning of June, we were, you know, it was easy for us to tell that uh, Lukashenko is doing this, the whole operation, bringing people in from Iraq, sending them to our border, is because he's he wants to put enough pressure 
that Lithuania backs down, backs down from support to opposition, backs down from support to Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya, and uh, not only them, but we have a thriving community of Belarusian democracy in, in Vilnius. Uh, so it was obvious that he would like us to step away from this. And we were very firm to say that, look, we're not, we're not going, going back. Uh, this is a meaningful choice. This is this is uh, this is what we this is who we are, and this is what we do. Um, and I can say that the things that now we're experiencing with the coercion, economic coercion, it's not a hybrid. It's more um, uh, the one that the world is more used to uh, that we are feeling from from China. Is uh, is a similar is going a similar direction, basically putting a lot of pressure. On, um, on a small country, on a small economy that stands with the people who are, uh, who want to have a meet more, more stronger relations with, with, with our country. And in essence to, you know, have the support in a European continent for their, for their democracy. And I'm talking about, about Taiwan, of course. So when it, this is all over, <laughs> you know, we will be able to say whether, whether the cannery has left the mine and uh, after after the week that I've spent here in Washington, I'm you know I'm I'm feeling quite a lot of fresh air, and uh, that uh, that gives a hope not only for for my country uh, but also for others who might wish to do the same thing because they feel strongly about it. And then I'm absolutely convinced that you know Lithuania in this is not alone because we feel so many eyes on us currently and during the the whole summer and during now. Uh, during this visit, that uh, basically, if uh, if we withstand, and uh, and um, that means that there is there is a possibility to do this, and it's a very important time, not not only for uh, for Lithuania, but also for democracies and democracy across uh, across the globe, because it it might be a turning point of some sorts, you know, of which way and how do we deal with. Um, uh, authoritarian encroachment, which I think is quite a, a real thing. So that would be for my uh, initial statement. Thank you. Can I just have one one quick follow? What what were your takeaways from your conversation with with Secretary Blinken? Um, I think that the the, the, the most important thing is uh, that we on both sides of the Atlantic, you know, if I might say so, uh, that we understand the, the geopolitical implications of what's what's going on. We see uh, the, the the meaning of the of the support of the democracies to democracies as a thing of today. That this is actually what what is happening today and why it is so it's so important. Um, so on a, on a strategic level, we we felt that we're standing on the on the same ground, and I think that this is the, the most important takeaway. Uh, obviously, I think that there are possibilities and um, ideas how Lithuania's position can be strengthened, how Lithuania's situation could be could become a rule book of sorts of how uh, democracies help other democracies. Uh, so so now what we're what we're talking with the administration here in Washington is mostly the ad hoc uh, support, ad hoc help to um, you know be it economic, be it um, Financial, be it investments, be it uh, security, things that you know that we can strengthen our cooperation in. But basically, the the, the biggest um, outcome of this could be that other countries would have a, a rule book, you know, where you open, okay, and if you're coerced, and you know you know where to go, and you know what to how how to withstand it. Thank you. I'm sure there'll be more questions coming out. Thank you very much, Minister. Lithuania is doing something very unprecedented, taking on two of the biggest geopolitical challenges um, you know, that the world is facing, uh, looking, taking on China in a way by exiting from 17 plus one in this past year, um, do, looking at you know, engaging with Taiwan in a way that has pushed buttons uh, and have been very unwelcome. At the same time, having such a significant challenge on your border and needing to respond to these innovative migration information, other uh, threats that are coming through Lukashenko's 
migration operation. What are the concrete costs that Lithuania is feeling based on this together? Are there certain painful points that you are seeing that you think that Europe or the transatlantic partners as such could really help in concrete ways in the short term and in the, let's say, five year term? Uh, because I think, you know, there is a lot of support in principle uh, to the question of democracy, to building resilience, to having cooperation on facing these challenges. What is less clear are what are the five things that the partners need to do this year and in the terms for leaders to make sure that solidarity and cooperation has practical impact. Well, um, thank you. Uh, I, I would have to start with, uh, with saying that uh, Lithuania is not uh, doing something against China. And I have to be very, uh, very clear about this. And, uh, you know, being from Baltics, we have a very, uh, an example that's very close to our hearts. When um, in 1990s, uh, when, uh, when Iceland was first to uh, recognize Lithuanian independence, Iceland was not doing something against Soviet Union. Uh, this is not something how we remember the situation, even though the, after the recognition of, of Lithuania, the uh, Soviet Union imposed sanctions on, on Iceland. Uh, I think they um, stopped uh, purchasing the fish from, from <laughs> that, that was fished in the Icelandic waters. Um, so our, and I have to, I have to say this because it's, it's also a very, a very practical approach. I think we need more deeper ties, economic, political ties with the like-minded countries across the globe. And first of all, democratic countries. And this was a very, uh, again, meaningful and transparent choice by Lithuanian government to, uh, to do that, you know, and we went on and uh, we opened an embassy in Australia. We opened an embassy in South, uh, South Korea. And we announced that we're uh, deepening our ties with, uh, with Taiwan. So we think that, and I'm, what I'm saying is practical because long-term, uh, I think that many would agree that business will win when they have a contract with a country that's democratic or with the companies from that country where the rule of law is a basic principle that's being upheld, where uh, arbitrary uh, sanctions do not happen because uh, some, you know, one of the, your politicians from your parliament invited uh, uh, Uyghurs to uh, you know to speak in the in the, in the plenary, so I think that you know where, where you we're often talking about them uh, the, the the value side of uh, support for democracy and human rights and, and rule of law, but I'm also saying that it's quite practical, you know it's it has a it has a practical side. Uh, now going back to the second side of your question about the the concrete issue, so I would say that on a uh, from from the coercion that we're feeling from China, short term there could be problems, and you know our companies are uh, feeling the pressure from you know from China. Uh, I would have to say that the biggest problems come from the supply chain, and this was part of our discussion here in, in Washington, because uh, especially being a small country, small economy, for us uh, securing the supply chain is quite a quite a challenge. But when we understand that similar problems, you know, countries like France, like like Germany, uh, even U.S. are are facing, especially when we're talking about the semiconductors. So basically, we're, we're in the same boat, and we have to think about the solution. How do we solve these sort of sort of questions, problems? Now, if I would be talking about um, uh, issues with Russia and, and Belarus, so what's incredibly worrying is uh, is the increased military cooperation between the two countries. Um, the biggest example, obviously, that the thing that is going on now, it's a uh, Zapad exercise, uh, but it's just a one, still one moment in the longer period that two countries are getting closer together in the military field. And we feel that it, um, it creates a, um, a defense uh, deficit, a security deficit. And, um, and once again, this is where we, we are seeking um, a closer cooperation with our transatlantic partners. 
because um, I think that this would also be a very, uh, very strong signal of a, of a transatlantic, um, of the meaningfulness of a transatlantic relationship. Thank you very much for those answers. We have a number of questions already trickling in and I'll turn those over to you because they come at various angles. Um, one question is specifically about the current conditions in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, there's a question from Carol Fink about uh, what is Lithuania's stance toward the impending Russian elections and towards the current Ukrainian government's crackdown on pro-Russian voices. Um, so that is from that angle. A different question uh, that we have is more about the question of alliances. Uh, this is from John Heffern. Uh, the question is, I know Lithuania agrees that we need to build the alliance back better. How can we use the new strategic concept to make us stronger? So this is uh, two sides. Let's see how it is possible to address them. Well, Russian election, I think I would start with that. It's, um, uh, it's indeed a, um, a worrying um, event. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as as uh, to call calling it election up front. Uh, and I have to say that we, the West, needs to be prepared um, to take a stance and um, and think about the non non recognizing the the election. Uh, having um, basically all um, members of the opposition in uh, either in exile or in jail uh, and um, with the, the, the evidence of fraud that is already coming in I think that it's um, where we would not we, there is a possibility that we won't won't find ourselves in a position to recognize uh, the election as as one that it's a legitimate one uh, and I know that it won't be easy decision for uh, on in European continent for many countries, I think. But then again, the message has to be very clear if we're on the side of, of uh, defending the democracies. Uh, the transatlantic, uh, yes, I, I have to say that um, the transatlantic relations is, is under attack. And uh, but I don't, I don't, I personally don't think that there's an alternative for the, for the world order or the situation that we, we find ourselves in. And therefore, uh, I find the discussion, but not discussions, but the, the possible decisions that would weaken uh, the transatlantic um, union quite, uh, quite dangerous for the, not only for the Baltic region, which I'm very, um, uh, sensitive about, but uh, uh, the whole the whole thing, um, and I think that there's there's a need to strengthen. First of all, the, that we need to strengthen trust, and that's a very difficult uh, question to answer. How do you do it? You know, is there a, is there a format? Is there a, a possible a venue of, for for discussion and debate? But basically, still, even though it sounds. Um, one might say it sounds naive, but I, I think that we need to start building up trust. And uh, because there is a definite deficit of it. And um, I, I cannot say, you know, which uh, is there uh, a country that you can point a finger and say, okay, the blame comes from that side. But I think that basically we do not need that uh, finger pointing right now, but we need to work on uh, on, on getting to know each other better and remind ourselves that basically the big portion of freedom and democracy that we have in the world is there because of tr strong transatlantic relationship. And with that lost, there is a possibility that big parts of democracy and liberty in the world would be lost as well. And I think that it's that important and that strategic. And I'm sorry, what the first question about Ukraine was, I... 
it was, you know, I think we can take it in a, in a different direction because I want to follow up a little bit more on this and on, on the you know, uh, transatlantic trust piece. Because here, I mean, it has not been the easiest week in transatlantic relations or the last couple of days. Uh, what are the right institutions? You're talking about the need to build trust in your visit here uh, and having these strategic conversations is a very important part of that, the, the bilateral building blocks. What other ways are are going to be the right ways uh, to increase that trust? Do we, is it a NATO frame? What role can NATO play in building that? What is the role for broader EU-US cooperation on this? We're going to have a transatlantic technology and uh, trade council soon. You mentioning challenges and supply chains when it comes to semiconductors and other pieces. Are we using all of our tools effectively? through alliances, through institutions to build that trust? And what are perhaps we not looking at right now? Um, I think that the upcoming TTC is a, is a good example. Uh, really, I'm, I'm very optimistic about it. I mean, optimistic in the sense that it's, it's happening. <laughs> I'm not sure whether about the, about the result. Uh, I don't think that it would be that easy, but but nonetheless, it's a, it's a very important milestone. Uh, I cannot stress it enough. Uh, basically, because it um, it covers a lot of uh, strategic uh, fears that uh, that we're having about uh, uh, the competition between EU and US that is being used by the adversaries. Uh, that they are actually uh, willing for us to to com compete in, in in many fields, and they are winning out of this. So I think that you know, for us to uh, to sit down and talk about some some you know start talking about the trade issues is is a definite definitely a step in the right direction, and I'm I'm very supportive of, the, of this. One thing that I've I'm I'm feeling that it's it's important and it needs not to be lost in uh, uh, from the from the view in in Washington is that actually what you mentioned is the bilateral uh, element in uh, in dealing with. Um, uh, with EU, um, because I, I, you know, we, we, many of us have wished that you know that EU would have a, a phone phone line, a phone number, you know, that you can call and, and fix the twenty seven countries. Uh, it's gotten better <laughs> during the last twenty years. Obviously, uh, you know, we have you know the institutions got stronger, uh, the leadership got stronger, but still we have twenty seven countries at the table, and therefore. Uh, bilateral relations are, are very important because they set most of the time they set the tone and if the mood gets sour around the table then you know you can you can keep calling the institutions but <laughs> the mood will be sour so i think that there is a, a need for um uh keeping and strengthening these these ties in, with the, with the partners in in eu and not um uh, not to forget that they're they're still very very important. So I think that my visit here it just uh, well again a step into the right direction. It it really helps uh, remind why and why it is important to have these ties and uh, how can we make them more effective. But then again, I mean I know that's a lot of work and I know that there are a lot of countries in the EU <laughs> and uh, still still more around it. But um, but it's you know I cannot stress it enough just how how can, how can you that you need to keep on building these 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 bridges uh, that later on will actually create this momentum for for getting back the trust that uh, sometimes feels a bit uh, wobbly mr minister i'm gonna sort of jump into and i think I, I suspect when you were talking to secretary blinken they agree with you on this on these needs and sort of the long-term <clears throat> need to strengthen these relations within institutions bilaterally. But I want to just turn back to the to these issues of democracy <clears throat> that you're talking about. There's a summit for democracy coming up this uh, in December. Um, so on one hand, I want to sort of ask your sort of expectations of that as a catalyst to support democracy in the way that you and Lithuanian government hope for. But I also want to bring in a question from David Kramer, who says, Mr. Minister, uh, thank you to you and your government and Lithuania for everything you're doing to defend and support democracy amid some very serious challenges, many of which you outlined 
what more would you like to see from your fellow EU member states in support of, of, of this democracy effort? What are the things that, that you'd like to see within the EU? So question one about the, democ the summit for democracy, which the White House uh, has laid out its vision for combating corruption, support for human rights, um, and addressing authoritarians. It sounds like these are issues that, that, that are near and dear to what Vilnius views as, as key challenges. And then also, if you could just maybe respond to, to David Kramer's question on, um, on what you would like to see from uh, fellow EU member states uh, in support of democracy and human rights, both within Europe itself, which I know there are some challenges, but also externally. I think I would start with, with the Summit on Democracy. Um, I think it's a very, uh, very timely um, event. It would be a very timely event of everything that's, what's, that's happening. Obviously, there are many questions about it. I think that the main thing that we would be looking into is, um, is a meaningful commitment by the countries that participate in it. Um, that it's not just a forum, it doesn't become a forum where we all agree on the things that we agree on. Because even now I know, you know, and everybody who's following, you know, we, we, we see sometimes differences even within EU. Uh, you know, there's, and the further you go, the, the more differences there arise between the democracies, but there are some building blocks that we have to agree that they are, they need to stay, they need to be there, and they need to be strengthened. Uh, so that's that's one of, one of the things. Now, um, what can we do uh, in, in EU? I think that we need not to lose sight of countries and communities uh, where democracy is, um, uh, is being fought for. And for us, it's very close to our heart. Is the is is the is the region of of um, uh, Eastern Partnership. And whenever we talk about Eastern Partnership, we usually talk about uh, countries like U Ukraine and, and and Georgia and Moldova. But I think that, for example, there's a, a very particular country that I'm um, I feel that it, it needs to have more attention and it needs to receive more help. That's that's Armenia. That actually has a as a, a striving uh, democracy under very difficult uh, conditions, and uh, I think that the EU and US. Um, well, the question was about EU. Uh, so basically, EU could do more to help. We have expertise, we have knowledge, and uh, with the help for democracy, actually comes a geopolitical power that e EU would like itself to 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 become or to see. So. Uh, the worst thing what would happen, and the same goes actually, I would mention Belarus. Because um, we need to be prepared as a EU for the possible event of, um, of the United, uh, of unification of Russia and Belarus that would actually go against the democratic will of the people. They, they didn't vote for Lukashenko. Uh, he is an illegitimate leader. So if he signs an agreement with, uh, with Russia, basically that's a non-democratic move. And we have to be very, very firm and very strong about it. And when, uh, when we're talking about possible sanctions and possible uh, repercussions for, for him, for his actions, for his non-democratic moves, same has to be, the same message has to be sent to, to Moscow saying that, Look, if you annex a country, it's it's not gonna go well. You know, there will there will be repercussions for that uh, because this is against the, the wish of the people. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we've been talking a lot about you know, democracy versus autocracy, support, uh, strategic support, and principle. The economic element here is always a is the challenge, right? The, the, this question of repercussions. We have a question from Roberta uh, Tunela. Um, 
is uh, to you saying that the you minister have mentioned the importance of economic ties between like-minded democratic countries. Um, but do you see on the other side that naturally that autocracies are doing the same thing, forming a block of opposition to the democratic world? Do you see any indication that that is the case in your own experience? So this is my adding, but you are engaging with a number of challenges at the moment. Do you see that these challenges are occurring separately? Your the, the Belarus and the economic implications of that and uh, some of these supply chain challenges with China. Uh, in your experience, are these separate? Is there some amount of piggybacking uh, on the situation that you are experiencing at the moment? And then returning to the original question, do you think the authoritarian inner support for one another, does it pose a threat to weaker democratic states and how should democrat democracies address it? Right. So it's a big philosophical question, but I think you at this particular moment in time can provide insights into you know, our questions on the big picture. Is it, how do these challenges build on one another? Oh. I don't think that it would be uh, something uh, particularly new to say that you know it's a, it's a very challenging time for um, one of the reasons is is that for the first time in a, probably in a very long time or pro probably the first time that we have a um, and it might sound harsh but we have a choice as a, as a possible choice for countries in their path, in, uh, in, in their evolution path, that autocracy or authoritarian government actually has become a meaningful choice. That's, that's what I would like to say. Um, in, um, during the Cold War, uh, especially in the later stage of the Cold War, it was, it was apparent that um, the Soviet Union is not an effective, uh, not an effective state. Uh, corruption, inefficiencies, uh, technological lagging behind was was has become more and more evident, and uh, that made everybody think, especially um, uh, Mr. Fukuyama, saying that look, this is this is inevitable. Democracy is the only way forward. It's the only efficient way for the government. It's the only right way forward, and. Uh, and it lulled many of us to uh, to this um, inevitability complacency. That basically we were so sure that look, I mean, one way or another, it's it's going to happen. It's uh, you know it, we probably have to be patient enough, and democracy will just spring up and in in, uh, in everywhere in North Africa, you know, uh, Central Asia, and and everywhere else. And suddenly now, especially with a very aggressive stance from, from China, the show of technological force from China, suddenly it becomes clear that, you know, the countries might have a meaningful choice. Like, why should I become a democracy? You know, why people, you know, there's a good example that, you know, it's possible to have a, an efficient country that's non-democratic, that's not built on rule of law and, and human rights and, and still get away with it. So this is the the biggest worry, and this is what we feel that is is different. That history is definitely not over. The question is, who is writing it? Uh, are we are we still <laughs> the ones with the, with the pen and, and and the paper? So that's that's a main you know philosophical philosophical worry, and this is the main alarm uh, that we need to wake up on because we have to really make a point for democracy. And and argue on on, demo, on democracy. Why why it is why it is so important, and why do we need the things that that build the, the, the free society in in the West? Um, and when I'm saying that the, the China model is is a dangerous one because I think that it gives argument for for other autocracies. And going back to your you know the, the first part of your question. Are they are they cooperating? And I think yes. You know, it's uh, sort of a franchising. Uh, basically, you know, you can say, look, I'm doing the same thing. You know, we're just uh, we're doing the same thing. And these ideas, the, 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 interestingly enough, they are they are appearing everywhere. And the West is not excluded from that because there there are I wouldn't say governments yet, but there are definitely parties in European Union who would say, look, I mean, this works. You know, why shouldn't we try it? 
and this is you know they're they're in um, minority obviously radical minority one might say but but still they're there and this this means that the, the idea is there uh, on a practical note is um, we've seen a lot of probably non coincidental coincidental uh, cooperation uh, between uh, our neighboring autocracies and and China um the moves the political moves made by china they were announced in the middle of of um of summer when we were feeling the pressure from belarus with migrants uh cyber attacks happening uh obviously people protesting against the covid restrictions and uh, vaccination so and uh, i i don't i have to say that it's um it's a cooperation of sorts, and uh, basically to try and find um, uh, the the biggest uh, pressing points for a country to to really break and and retreat from from their stance. Um, so this is this is a signal for the future as well, because in the future I think that we would see we would see more of it. Thank you very much for that. And I think that's just a very interesting point for how we address a lot of these questions on this side. We've been trying over the past few years uh, under the framework of hybrid or other threats to try to see that a cyber attack or an information operation, um, or in this case, migration, are, are not necessarily separate and we need to look at them together. But looking then across actors as well and how they may be using opportunities um, is, is important and it really stretches a lot of our own conceptual frameworks or in our institutional frameworks, uh, because we are looking at areas that are in different regions uh, and desks that perhaps address this are, are different in, in all of our institutions and in our own countries. So I think having this example of what Lithuania is going through right now, uh, I think will force us to be more creative um, and also more resilient in the response that we can get from it. We have some questions about, well, what do you do about it next? And there's a question from Noah Barkin, um, who is also uh, at GMF. Uh, I'm curious for Minister Lensbed's view of the year of the EU's three-pronged approach to China, a partner, a competitor, a rival, which dates back to March 2019. This implies a degree of, comp of compartmentalization in the relationship that doesn't seem to be working very well in practice. I think a lot of people would ask themselves these days where China is a partner in the EU. Does this approach need to be updated? And I would add when you uh, saw Ursula von der Leyen's criticism of China uh, on even climate, which has often been considered the greatest area of potential cooperation, uh, there, you know, this brings a question where, where does partnership lead? Uh, where does partnership exist right now? And is the EU on the right track in its approach? I'm a strong believer of. Uh... A partnership that are that are based on uh, some sort of uh, basic uh, common principle, and uh, I'm not I'm not convinced that we can have meaningful partnerships with Russia or China, even on climate, and especially when uh, when China is saying like if you want uh, us to to cooperate with you on climate, you know you have to stop asking questions about Uyghurs. And uh, so, <laughs> how does that cooperation will work in the future? I'm, I'm not uh, one hundred percent sure. Uh, and what are are we going to um, to forfeit and in and and trying to uh, uh, pursue this 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 partnership? So, basically, I I still believe that countries have to have this common understanding of rule of law, basically of this Roman principle of a contract being made. And that is uh, that is binding the both both sides, and um, that you have to have a, some sort of a equal footing between between both sides. And I don't think that you can have it uh, meaningfully with um, non-democratic countries. It's very difficult to to expect that they will hold on to their part of the agreement. Um, the European approach is um, I don't think that it's 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 working partially also for the similar reasons because um, and we've been advocating as, as a Lithuania between the between the other member states that the question of format 
of how do you talk with China is a very important one. Uh, because now it's either what was recently known as 17 plus one, now it's 16 plus one. Either it's bilateral, where bigger countries have a bilateral uh, contact with, with China. And basically, there's nothing else. So how can you approach on this three-way three -way approach with China? Who, who does speak for, for, your, for Europe? Who will say the things that China doesn't want to hear? Who who is that? Who is that person? Because you know, if China sets the the topics for discussion, they will be pleasant ones. They will be the cooperation that China needs. They will be the 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 angles that China sees beneficial, but not the not the European not the European countries. So I think that's that's is why it's flawed, and we've seen that very uh, vividly last year when uh, there was an intention to sign the comprehensive agreement on investment between EU and in China, and all the way to uh, to December there was almost no public discussion about you know how should we you know is it a good good thing to sign it, and just when it became public that okay this is us this is EU signing this uh, this huge agreement with with China suddenly you had you started hearing the public uproar and people were not happy not happy at all and one of the reasons now that it's stuck in in the European Parliament with no clear sight of how to get through through this this is basically saying that we don't have a venue to express what we think about different things that we're having and seeing with China if we only take the one part, investment part, which is probably, you know, we could we could talk about this, but among other things, we need to talk about forced labor. We need to talk about human rights abuses. We have to have a possibility to talk about economic coercion. If we don't, and we just talk about uh, investment part, then how can you have a three-way uh, conversation? I mean, not three-lane three, uh, uh, discussion. With, with China, you're just talking one, you're just talking to a partner who is, you know, who does everything right. So I think this is the, 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 the big problem and we really need to find a way, how do we change this? And um, the proposal that was made by our president was that we should have a format that would be uh, called, you know, we could call 27 plus one. You know, let's have a table with everyone on board. Let's invite China and then let's discuss everything. Let's, you know, let's have a, a whole menu. And people are saying, oh, well, China would not like it. Yeah, I mean, probably. But if we say that this is this is the table, then yes, let's let's talk. This is the power of you. Otherwise, you know, it's just 27 countries that are trying to have their own uh, strategy and not having some uh, some meaningful strategy of 27. Prime Minister, I think you just made a case for why you need this this transatlantic approach to, to work um, and. Um, and, and certainly agree with you that, that it tends to be authoritarian in terms of breaking, breaking agreements. We certainly see that with the Kremlin breaking multiple agreements over many years uh, under, under uh, Mr. Putin. And of course, China, you know, you know, it's critical that they're part of the solution to some of these global problems like climate change. Uh, but we'll see if they're willing to, you know, how they're willing to play is important. I have two quick questions. I want to shift the conversation. <clears throat> One is um, is going to be a focus on economic, an economic question that's coming from um, Nick Kesvini Gore, uh, and then also from Sandy Vershbau on on NATO and Ukraine. Uh, Nick asks a question: Can the foreign minister discuss the importance of the Three Cs initiative and the need for the Development Finance Corporation, which uh, is in the United States, to fulfill uh, the one billion dollar pledge for infrastructure projects? And also maybe comment on the importance of U.S. financing to counter Chinese uh, 5G technology. Uh, so there's one question about three Cs and sort of more of this economic commitment. I see that underlying part of your conversation this week with U.S. officials was is about infrastructure. It's about economic and strengthening economic engagement. Um, and then also the second question from Sandy uh, Vershbau is that, uh, I'll, I'll read it, uh, Mr. Putin has questioned Ukraine's right to exist as an independent state, declared Ukraine's NATO membership as a red line. NATO remains divided over challenging this red line uh, has and has rebuffed Zelensky's campaign for a membership action plan. 
which has, has long been sort of out there, hanging out there. Baltic membership was once a red line for, for Moscow, yet NATO ultimately did the right thing. What role can the Baltic states play in breaking the deadlock inside NATO and convincing other allies to open a pathway for Ukraine's uh, future membership in NATO? So, so two questions, but I think uh, one on security that that has that is out there. We just had recently had the Zelensky Biden uh, meeting in the White House, um, and and the issue of NATO membership or even movement forward, uh, you you didn't see a great deal of progress in other areas, yes, but this area no. So if you could maybe speak to that, but also the Three Seas Initiative, uh, which I which is interconnected with this and by which. Also, Ukraine is implicated as, as well as other uh, Eastern European countries in a, in a project that is supposed to be both about security, economics, and energy. So if I could ask you those two big questions and uh, over to you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the Three C's initiative is an, uh, is an easy question to answer. I think it's a very useful format. Uh, obviously, uh, it, um, it needs uh, it needs investment. It needs the the promised one billion <laughs> uh, in order to you know to uh, take off um, because now it's more of a still a political concept than than actually an, an instrument that could start working. Um, if it were to take off, and I'm 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 sure that it it still can, and I'm 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 thinking that we're on the right track. I think the added layer could be. Um, with the things, not only with about the infrastructure it can create within the uh, within the region, especially in the EU, interconnections, uh, energy, or 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 other otherwise, but I think that it can, with the right uh, with the right direction and the right political mindset, it could create stronger links between EU and the Eastern Partnership countries, because. Uh, we, we, we're seeing that one of the biggest problems that now uh, countries in, um, in the Eastern Partnership, especially Ukraine and Moldova, are facing, they are because of the lack of uh, infrastructure connecting them to EU, be it gas pipelines, be it uh, electricity pipelines like in, in Moldova, where they're totally dependent on the Transnistrian uh, uh, electricity generating capacity. Uh, so I think that this is actually one of the ways how can we help the countries um, become more independent from the this the Soviet post-Soviet grid that actually you know had many of us bound, and and Lithuania is uh, is breaking off the shackles one by one you know with uh, with LNG now the um, energy and 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 uh, electricity and other things. But we have to understand that those countries are even more uh, uh, sh shackled in in that in in that sense. So, three C's initiative could be one of the tools to to help them to help them in this in this direction. So, I think that it would be interesting and important to to look at. Um, Lithuania is is an interesting example as well of uh, of the costs of uh, of actual economic and financial costs of, uh, of taking a stance. So we have some strong laws about, uh, about defending our uh, 5G infrastructure. And, um, and we already have a numbers that, uh, how much are we going to pay extra for the, for the equipment and infrastructure that we're, we're building? And it's quite a lot for, for our economy. So I think that uh, I've raised this question as well uh, during my conversations that it could be looked into uh, in a way that we need to see whether there are any obstacles or barriers for investment, the Western investment, uh, transatlantic investment coming into um, uh, e EU countries like, like, like Lithuania, because that could alleviate uh, the additional costs that we are, uh, we, we are paying. Uh, for 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 the stance, which is also uh, a sort of a security stance that that is this important for the region. Now about Ukraine, uh, I can I can talk currently about our our country's position. So we've been a, a strong supporter of U Ukraine's path to to NATO, uh, and we we are and we remain and we will we will continue to to help the country 
in any way that we can, sharing our experience on their reforms and, and, and whatnot. So that's that's not not the change, not about the change. The problems are actually what we are seeing is that Ukraine situation is not is not overly optimistic, you know, especially what, what happened uh, during the spring with the militarization of uh, Ukrainian border. Russia brought a lot of equipment and a lot of uh, troops on the border. So, um, and the whole situation is still rather fragile. And, um, and my strong belief is that, especially after the Nord Stream 2 uh, issue, I think that Ukraine needs more guarantees from the West about how, um, how can we all help uh, secure this situation, secure what's already been achieved because they achieved a lot. And we might wish that they would have achieved more. And uh, I'm still confident that they will, they will achieve that in, in, the, in the near future. But we need to secure what has already been achieved because it's still rather fragile. And I'm talking not only from domestic point of view, but from the, uh, from the, from the security uh, point of view. Thank you so much. There's a there are a few questions that come at many of this democratic, uh, you know, the, the democratic question from a different side, which is the domestic. Lithuania has been advocating for the cause of democracy globally, uh, but are you also looking at how to refresh and strengthen democracy internally? Uh, we have questions that refer to a sense of dem democracy atrophy, not being responsive enough uh, at home. Is this a question that you feel is something that Lithuania is also looking at at home uh, of how to increase its own strength and vibrancy uh, and openness to, to society at this particular moment in time? Well, I cannot be objective in answering this question, being a, an acting politician and a member of parliament. Uh, I, can, I can tell, you know, but I have to, you know, I have to make a disclaimer that you know, I'm, I'm, I am subjective, obviously, and it's, it's best uh, to answer this question. Somebody else would be better suited to answer this question, how they see the situation in, in Lithuania um, from, from outside. Um, we, we had, and I personally, I was leading the, uh, the opposition for, for some time during the last four years before the election. Um, and we've seen ways of how uh, how easy it is to, 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 to have democracy uh, deterioration. We're not a particularly unique country in, in, in Europe. You know, we, there are countries in the region who are facing similar things. So uh, I can say that democracy is under attack. It is. And, uh, and the fight can be sometimes very, um, very short. And uh, so we've we've seen and we've witnessed very uh, in the front row how how things can happen, and I think that at least from coming from my party, you know, we we gave a pledge that we do not want to see that happening, and we will do our our best to you know that not to let that happen in in our country. So I'm convinced subjectively <laughs> that we are in a good position internally. So we're not preaching something uh, that we do not believe ourselves and that we do not uh, internally that we are not practicing ourselves. So that is a very, very important thing to me to be to be honest about about what you uh, uh, what you talk internationally. And obviously, but the challenges are are, are are there. COVID, that's one thing, you know, it's a huge challenge on the society. Uh, with all the questions that are arising, you know, how do you deal with uh, anti-vaccinations? You know, how do you convince people? How do you um, deal with the protesters that you know one day turn violent and, and things like that? It's it's a it's a huge new, new questions I, I have to say. And now added layer is also the migration thing, uh, which is which poses a lot of questions. You know, how can you um, how do you deal with migration crisis when the migration is weaponized? when people are forced upon you, when you have no capacity whatsoever to, to deal with a wave upon wave of the people who cross your border illegally. And how do you maintain the humane approach, but still you defend your borders? And these questions are, are incredibly important. And uh, 
Well, I have to say that, you know, we are, we are sort of, again, one way or another, we're writing something, a, a new chapter in this, because, you know, the government currently feels very strongly about the democratic values. And uh, we know and are aware about the red lines that are uh, drawn in, in, um, on the ground. Uh, but, uh, but then again, you have to, you know, that, that you have to get your people vaccinated, convince them to get vaccinated and then control the virus, the spread of the virus, control your borders and defend, defend your country from the, uh, foreign, foreign pressure. So basically this is, this is a very, uh, difficult debate, but I'm convinced at this point that we're, we're managing it. Thank you very much for these insights. We have come to the end of the hour that we have with you, but I really appreciated your explanations and insights into Lithuania's experience both at home and in its global challenges. So I want to thank, Gabe, say a big thanks to, to you, Minister Lansbergis, for the to the embassy, the Lithuanian embassy in Washington, and to all of my colleagues at GMF Jonathan for kicking off this conversation and your leadership here and also on democracy initiatives, and to our wonderful team, including John Alexander, who makes sure that we can have a conversation like this uh, with all of us in our boxes, having deep insights and sharing our impressions. Thank you very much. I hope this is uh, one of many that we'll be having with you as we go deeper into many of these issues. Have a wonderful day, whether in Europe or the US and uh, see you again soon. Before Minister. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for organizing this. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.